Hey, First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes. I want to welcome you to our Wednesday Word. Uh, again, so good to be with you tonight. I want to thank you guys for joining and being a part of this. And uh, man, if you're watching online, Facebook, YouTube, man, hit like, hit subscribe, comment, let us know you're there. Uh, we want to hear from you. And if you've got a prayer request, we'd love to, to know so that we can pray uh, be in agreement with you for what the Lord is doing. Uh, we've been taking several weeks now. We've been focusing on a verse that probably all of us have heard and even quoted several times in our lives. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear uh, and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And uh, I, I love this. I just I, I keep coming back to this verse. It's a truth that I think we need to hear often in our lives because I believe all of us in some way, shape, or form combat fear. And, and I think what this verse tells me is that in any situation, I don't have to be afraid that I can stand in faith in him. And, and I love this because it's so practical uh, to our lives and it's important to our every day because it's not like our enemy is going to give us his schedule. Uh, it's not like the devil's going to let you know when he's going to attack and where he's going to try to make you afraid. He, he just tries to get you to fear. And we know this. And so you and I, Ephesians 6 tells us, we have to daily put on the full armor of God and, uh, and doing that because the enemy is at work trying to make us uh, live in fear because fear limits our lives. Fear limits our dreams and fear keeps us from walking in the fullness of, of who God says we are and who you are you know, in Christ. And so we've talked about this for weeks that, that it really is personal. Um, you know, these aren't generic church statements that you just say that don't have roots into stuff. You know, the enemy has never cared about you. The devil only has three goals about your life, and that is steal, kill, and destroy. That's who he is, and that's what he does. And I don't think he's capable of doing anything else. That's all that he does. Um, and he will use our senses. We've been talking about our five kings, or five senses, to lead us to fear. Now, our senses are not evil. Uh, our senses are not sinful, but they're not always honest with us. And so they can't necessarily be foundational in how we live and how we respond to things. We always have to come back to this reality of what does God say? Um, not what do I feel or what do I see or what do I hear or what do I smell? What do I taste? What do I touch? What does God say? That ha It always comes back to that, that word. You know, we got to know and trust that God is with us. And so we have to walk in our measure of faith. And, I, and again, I think trials and struggles all help us. We say grow our faith. I think it makes us more aware of the measure of faith that God has given us. And as I become more aware of it, uh, I am able to function in it and walk in it. And faith, that gift of faith to your life is a gift of God to our lives. And in that, we experience the peace of God in any situation or we're able to. You know, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace, uh, while that heat killed the people who threw them in, it didn't kill them. Uh, in fact, all that the fire did, um, and the heat was burn up the things that bound them. Uh, it burned up the things that, that were limiting them. And, and uh, I love that. So I, I want you to think about that practically in your life. Uh, you know, have you ever faced something you thought was going to be the end? You know, this is, there's, this is it. There's no way out of this. Uh, this is what my life is going to be from this point forward because that's what the enemy told you. That's what the enemy made you feel. That's what the enemy showed you. And you believed it, but God was with you. And God showed you that his truth is greater than any lie of the enemy. And when God was bringing you out of that place that felt like an end, you kind of realize that your story is the same story as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That you're coming out of something that you thought was going to be the end and you're not smelling like smoke. You don't look like you've been in the fire. And all that got burned up were the lies that the enemy told you and tried to tie you up with. You know, we can come out of fiery times, we can come out of the furnace more free than we went in because of faith. And so I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to smell like what I've been through. I don't have to look like what I've been through. Uh, but we've all met people, you know, I say that, but we've all met people who smell like where they've been. 
You know, you go through an ugly situation and you carry anger and hurt. You you go through a hurtful situation and years down the road, you're still bitter. You're still holding on to it. And and we smell like what we've been through. You know, Lazarus, uh, he'd been dead for four days and been buried and all that was left was the crying. I mean, it's literally, they showed, Jesus shows up and they said, had you been here, you wouldn't have died. But now it's too late. He's dead. He's buried. He's sealed. Lord, he stinks. You know, and we've all had moments like that where we felt like that. It's too late. It's too broken. It smells too bad. Uh, it's too far down the road to go back and fix and heal and restore. But I love how God always finds a way of bringing it back to our faith. And he says, if you only believe. And that's really the challenge for us. Do you really believe that God can change your situation? Um, not just earthly hope. You know, not just flip a coin, not just throw a penny in a wishing well, but do you genuinely believe that God can change the situation that you're in, that God can resurrect what feels dead to you, uh, or the situation in your life that stinks? You know, that is a question that I think we have to keep in front of us in our prayer, in our, in our faith, in our building of our lives. Uh, do I really believe? You know, because I think... For us to really find true healing and true breakthrough, we have to believe what God says about you and your life. You have to. Uh, you know, Genesis 27, when Jacob was trying to steal the birthright uh, from Esau, you know, he put Esau's clothes on and put goat skins on his arms. And he, he went into Isaac to see him. And Isaac said, you smell like Esau and you feel like Esau, but you sound like Jacob. Uh, but he blessed him anyway. And uh, he didn't trust what he heard. Uh, and he ended up giving the birthright to the wrong person. And, you know, I just think I, I read that and I just think God help me hear the truth and believe the truth when I hear it. Um, because it's the truth that sets us free. And Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing that is hearing the good news about Christ. The good news should overcome. And you got to listen to me. The good news of God, the word should overcome every offense, not most uh, not three quarters, not seven eighths, every offense. Uh, if you've been offended by your family, if you've been offended by someone's words, there are, there are so many ways that we can be offended uh, today, but you can't let offense rob you or trick you into missing something that God has for you. And so we've got to be able to let go. Um, last week we looked at the power of sight and how it tricks us. And Genesis 37, you know, Jacob uh, who was the one who stole the birthright from his brother is now reaping what he sowed. And now his kids are pulling some shenanigans. And his favorite son, Joseph, uh, was going out. His brothers saw him. And <coughs> they, uh, long story short, I'll encourage you to go back and read it. Genesis chapter 37. It's a great story. Um, they ended up faking his death, selling him, uh, and, and ended, up, ended up in Egypt. In Potiphar's house, ended up in jail, ended up then in the palace. <coughs> and uh, they tricked uh, his father because they took his coat, his clothes that he was wearing, they tore it up, put blood all over it, showed it to Jacob, and said a wild animal killed him. And based on what he saw, <coughs> coughing up a lung here, based on what he saw, he believed it. Uh, to be true. And one of the translations says that uh, without a doubt, meaning he believed in perfect faith. And that just really kind of grabbed me. He believed in perfect faith, something that wasn't true. And, and so I, I, I have to take that and I have to say it is possible for me to believe with perfect faith, with confidence in something that just isn't true. And isn't this what the enemy tries to do? Isn't this what the enemy tries to get us with? Is he tries to get you to believe in something completely that isn't true and then we're torn and we struggle when we aren't set free because in our mind, truth sets us free. Uh, listen, just because you believe in something doesn't make it true. Truth is true. And even though it wasn't true, it was completely true in the eyes of Jacob based on what he saw because he was convinced his son had been killed by an animal. Uh, when the truth is, his brother sold him and he was in Egypt. But look what God does. He ends up working his way up from Potiphar's house to the prison, from the prison to the palace, to the second in place, second in charge. And the famine hits and everyone's starving and there's no food anywhere. But God has positioned Joseph and he's able to help his family survive the famine. And his words are this, though you meant this for harm, God meant this for good. And 
And I just think, God, help me respond like that to moments and times of offense in my life when he could have, he had the power to get even. Uh, he had probably, you know, you and I would say, hey, you know, hey, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. He probably had the right to get even. And yet his heart was so set on God. And he said, I won't let offense, I won't let my senses control me. What does God say I should be? And what does God say I should do? And that's how he responded. You know, the whole time that God is moving him and positioning him to save his family later, his dad is still grieving the death of his son because he had complete faith in a lie. Uh, it's not the only thing. You know, Elisha, surrounded by army, horses and chariots, and his servant was scared and wanted to know, what are we going to do? Uh, but when he prayed and he had his eyes open, he saw the Lord's army and angels and chariots of fire surrounding the enemy. You know, if all that we saw was what he saw, I think we all would have been scared. You know, if all you do is see ground level, I think we sometimes miss the miraculous. And so we've got to be able to say, hey, God, help me to see this the way you see this and not just with my physical eyes. I don't think God wants us falling apart every time something challenging comes along. You know, even in our darkest moments, even in our, our most fearful moments, we don't have to be afraid because there's always more at work than what I see. You know, if you live by sight or just by what you hear, there's always going to be something to be scared of. You know, if you're a fearful person, there's always something to be fearful of. But if you are a faithful person, I think there's always a reason to believe and trust in God. All right. In life, you're going to hear a lot of negatives. Um, you're going to hear a lot of negativities and and uh, accusations in your life, but you can't let what you see in the natural deceive you because we could be putting perfect faith into something that simply isn't true according to God. Uh, you got to remember the devil's a liar. Uh, not just today, not just sometimes. He's always a liar. Now, 1 Kings 17 is a great story about what you hear. And in our faith fight, you know, the battles that we are in, we got to put our foot on the neck of what you hear because it can lie to you. And, and so I want you to think about this. You know, when the enemy comes to attack you, when the enemy comes to uh, uh, discourage you, uh, what does the enemy whisper to your life to make you afraid? Um, you know, think about that. How does he come after you? How does he fight you? It's not all the same. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, and so I think the enemy attacks us uniquely and specifically. Um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You know, what does he come to your life with and try to make you afraid? Because you can't let what you hear rob you. Um, in 1 Kings 17, uh, Elijah has announced to the king that it's not going to rain, and it hasn't rained now uh, for three years. You know, you talk about global warming. That's real global warming. No rain for three years. And all people could talk about was the famine and trying to figure out how they were going to survive. I mean, animals were dying. It was not good. It was not good. And, uh, but God had spoken to Elijah that it wasn't going to rain. He said, it's not going to rain until I tell you. And then in chapter 18, he comes, Elijah says, Hey, listen, it's going to rain. Get ready. And so in 1 Kings 18.41, Elijah says to Ahab, Go get something to eat and drink, for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. Um, and I love this, because I'm hearing something different in the Spirit. I know it hasn't rained for three years, but I'm telling you it's going to rain, because the Lord is telling me that. I hear a mighty rainstorm, you know. And I think sometimes it's, it's good for us to sit down and take a minute and ask ourselves that question. What do I hear? Um, can I in my life tune out the flesh and what it craves and hear the storm brewing? Even though I don't see a cloud in the sky, even though there's no winds blowing, even though there's no mist or rain falling, if God says it's going to rain, can I tune out the rest of the stuff and say, I hear a storm coming? Because when Elijah said this, there was literally nothing in the sky pointing to a storm. Uh, and I know what you're saying, but I know what I'm hearing. You know, I love that. Uh, but what are you tuned into? You know, Elijah during the famine, he had to trust God to provide for him. In 1 Kings 17, uh, God told him, go down by a creek. And that's where he got his water. God had ravens bring him food daily. And he ate and drank and was sustained by God in that season of famine through it all. Listen, do you trust God in your season of life to provide and cover you? 
Uh, I mean, really trust him, not just words, not just, oh, yeah, church statements. I get it. Oh, yeah, trust the Lord. He blessed. But do you really trust God to provide for you and your home? You know, we hear a lot of things today, a lot of stuff uh, in the world. You know, it's we probably all ought to limit the amount of news that we watch. You know, you got open borders. You got gas prices higher than they've ever been uh, before. You've got people falling away from faith. Um, and, you know, uh, often. And, and you've got war in Ukraine. You've got China in the wings waiting to see what's going on. I mean, these are, these are things that if that's what we fill our lives with, <coughs> there's a lot to be afraid of. There's a lot to be concerned about, you know, in this world. And you can even be discouraged. How am I going to make it? How are we going to do it? Um, and, and these are real things. These are real things. But one of the things that you'll never hear from God's word uh, is that you aren't going to make it. God's word never says, thus saith the Lord, this is pretty much the end of it for you. Uh, he doesn't say that. God says you'll never hear anything that, that, that in the word that says that God isn't faithful. God is faithful. That's what his word tells us. Uh, you're never going to hear that God doesn't care. God does care. God cares for you. He cares for your life. The word of God teaches us that in spite of what I'm hearing and seeing, that God is faithful. And he proves that. John 12, 28 to 29 says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard and said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Scripture says that a voice came from heaven and the people standing right there missed it. They said, no, it, it, it had to be thunder." Listen, this is why you can be in a service or a small group or a Sunday school and God is speaking to you. You know, worship is happening and you are just, you're feeling it, man. You are worshiping God. You're experiencing his presence. Uh, God's doing something in you and the person sitting right beside you uh, doesn't hear a thing. God is real. God is pouring out. But you're willing to hear something they're not ready to hear yet. You're open to hear the storm brewing when there's not a cloud in the sky yet. Another thing is this. What do you taste um, in, in, in our sense of taste? You know, 2 Kings 4, Elisha, the protege to uh, Elijah, is in a time of famine, and he told his servants to go make some stew for a group of prophets that had come together. And he goes and picks some wild herbs and comes back and makes it all a pot of, you know, whatever. And they start to eat it. Apparently, one of the gourds that he picked was poisonous. And they start to eat it, and they say, this tastes of death. There's poison in it. And they were going to throw it all away. But look what Elisha does. It says 2 Kings chapter 4, 38 to 41. Now Elisha now returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. And one day, as a group of prophets was seated before him, he said to his servant, Put a large pot on the fire, and make some stew for the rest of the group. One of the young men went out into the field to gather herbs and came back with a pocket full of gourds. He shredded them, put them in the pot without realizing that they were poisonous. Some of the stew was served to men, but after they had eaten a bite or two, they cried out, Man of God, there's poison in the stew, so they would not eat it. Elisha said, Bring me some flour, and he threw it into the pot and said, Now it's all right, go ahead and eat, and then it did not harm them. You know, flour in this represents the word of God, and they ate the stew, and it did no harm. Listen, I'm going to ask you, what is the world feeding you? What are you feeding your life? You know, sometimes the best way to stay safe from something is to turn off the TV. Because if you get caught in it, lost in it, consumed with it, we are so tempted to live fearful because they never come with great news. It's always something terrible happening somewhere. You know, something happens to you. Something goes on in your life, your marriage, and it leaves a bitter taste in your mouth, and it's like a poison to you. Well, what happens when offense or unforgiveness threatens your marriage? Do you throw the whole marriage away to spare yourself from the poison, or do you take the Word of God and apply it to that situation and have the Word of God be a healer or function as a vaccination to the poison in our lives? You know, when poison attacks through God's word, we show grace and forgiveness and healing to an offense. You put it under your feet. To overcome the bitter taste in your mouth, you have to learn how to forgive others. Because if you let it take root in your heart, it will grow and it will poison you. And when you're poisoned, your words are going to be poisoned and your actions are going to be poisoned. You know, some of you have been through some stuff and, and you don't understand. You know what? Sometimes we can carry anger towards God. 
we've got to let go of those emotions. You know, why did God let this happen to me? Why did God let me go through this? Why did God let me lose this or that person? Why did this happen? And it's interesting because if you felt like someone wronged you, I would say you have to forgive that person. Uh, but, but sometimes, you know, we kind of have these anger feelings and emotional feelings towards God. And, and I'm not saying we have to forgive God because God does nothing wrong. God is perfect. But I will say this, we do have to sometimes let go of some emotions and animosity that we hold towards him because it limits our lives. You know, sometimes we got to forgive ourselves. Um, and I get this, you know, I, I, I get this. I, I think I'm probably tougher on me than most people are tough on me. Uh, and, and so I'm harder on me than most folks are hard on me. And, and, uh, and sometimes you just got to tell yourself it's okay. You know, you got to forgive yourself. You got to let go and say, it was a mistake. I own it. I'm going to move forward and live free and be free. Uh, you got to, don't let these things leave a bad taste in your mouth. Psalms 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. You know, everything's bigger in the dark, but when you pull it into the light and put your foot on its neck and you say, I know that the Lord is good. Because God is bigger than your worst nightmare. You know, what you're facing right now, God is with you. God is for you, and you can taste and see that he is good. Blessed are you, it says, when we take refuge in him. So we fight the fight of faith. We take authority over the natural. We agree with the word of God about what it says to you and what it says about you. Uh, because faith knows how to fight. And this is why we have to be faith-driven. It knows how to fight. It wins. It's never lost a battle. You know, ask the Red Sea, ask Goliath, ask, uh, you know, the, the, the lion in the pit, um, ask uh, Daniel in the lion's den, ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, just go through. People who took stands of faith with God, God uh, brought them through. He does that. And so faith is a weapon. It is a divine weapon that will help us defeat the attack of the enemy in our lives. Um, and, and it will swallow up fear and allow you and I to walk in the purpose of God for our lives. Uh, 2 Samuel 22.30 says, In your strength I can crush an army with my God. I can scale any wall. You know, uh, I just find almost any miracle is always on the other side of a challenge or an obstacle. And uh, we can make the leap. Uh, you can. In faith by faith, we can make the leap. We can climb the wall we can overcome the mountain uh, and experience victory. So what's the wall that you need to jump from? You know, one author, author I read said this, let faith fight like white blood cells in your body attacking the infection of fear. Uh, and I thought that was kind of cool. You know, there's only one fear that I think scripture says we should have, and that's the fear of the Lord. Uh, you know, Psalms 19.9, the fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. See, the, fur, the fear that the world wants you to have is tormenting and it's draining and it just pulls life from us. It sucks the life out of us. But walking in the fear of the Lord releases us from the fear of the world. It says it's pure and it endures. Uh, and I love that. So put your foot on the neck of the king of taste and get rid of bitterness and unforgiveness and offense and all the things that leave a bad taste in your mouth couple of scriptures before I go. Psalm 60, 12 says, With God we will gain the victory and he will trample down our enemies. Romans 8, 37 says, No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. In 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So take a few minutes tonight and ask yourself this, what has led, left a bad taste in my mouth? Uh, how am I handling that? You know, there are things we're tempted to throw away because they're poisoned. When God says, let me heal it, let me restore it, uh, apply the word of God to it. Uh, so don't throw away what's valuable that we simply need to trust God with and grow in, all right? What do you need to jump uh, in faith? What wall is out there? What's the thing that's obstructing you, keeping you, limiting you today? Because God says you can overcome, you can scale any wall. Uh, let's trust him, let's taste and see that he is good because he is good all the time. 
First Assembly, I love you and I bless you guys. I pray you all have a great week and I'm encourage you, tell somebody about Jesus. God bless.